children, I'm going to continue in 1 John. I'll read to you, I think, the whole chapter. Um, chapter 3. For our own sakes, that we're reminded of where we're at. And then I'm going to speak to you, God willing, from verses 20, or 19 to 21. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew not him, or knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear <coughs> what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither hath known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Listen to this, friends. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth, not his brother. For this is the message that ye have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who would who was of the wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye you know that no murderer hath eternal life. Abiding in him. Verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brothers have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not live in word neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Verse 19, And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our heart before him. Verse 20, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. This is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of, of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as he gave the commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he has given us. Amen. Amen. So we're going to, today, as many of you know, we've been going through this epistle forever and a day. We're getting there. But we're going to concentrate today on verses 19 to 21 in particular. But let us really start again where I last finished, which doesn't, in all honesty, seem like an age ago. The context that I have read tells us this. We ought to love the brethren. 
we ought to love the brethren. That the Apostle John makes it very clear, very clear indeed, as I have just read one chapter. But you will see, if you are familiar with this epistle, what you will see is repetition. What you will see is John reminding us, actually, all the while, love God, love the brethren. It's clear that to love the brethren is very much evidence, proof, fruit, that you love God. I think that is underestimated in the church today. You love the brethren. You love one another. Comes off the tongue easy, doesn't it? Love one another. Easy said, far more difficult to achieve. Verse 19 says, Hereby, or rather it can be translated, or by this we know. By this we know. We know. John says, by the love we we are of the truth. Where were you finished? Last time. You see, the epistle here, he deals with assurance. And as we discussed by faith alone on Friday night, really what we touched was the lack of assurance within Christians today. John is saying, look, if you, if, you, if you measure this up, if you know that you love the brethren, it is one of, I'm not saying it's the only, it's why context and the, the preaching through the book is very important, so take into consideration what we've already learned, that the evidence that you belong to God is that you love the brethren, that you love God's people. You see, all the way through this apostle, John says this. John is saying this to you this morning. A Christian looks like this. Be interested, wouldn't it, if we were all to go away and write one page of A4 paper on what a Christian was. What is a Christian? What does a Christian look like? What does a Christian look like? Question maybe to go away and answer. Can we look in the mirror and say it looks like this? Can we look at one another and say it looks like him? What does a Christian look like? I think John helps us here by absolutely without any doubt showing us what a Christian looks like. John does it again and again throughout this great epistle. If you love God, you love the brethren. Again, I want to I want to confidently and boldly say that it's easy said, but more difficult to do. But let's not shrink from that. That does not become passive about it, and that does not just become people with good rhetoric about it. Love the brethren. Love the brethren. Love the brethren. Love. Let's love one another. We're so passive about these things. I think the church has become passive about these things. If we, this is the reality of, of humanity. You see, all, all Hollywood, Hollywood's a lie. Hollywood's a lie. If we, a church, we're not all here this morning, but if we were to go and stay in some beautiful farm and we grew crops, and, and we looked after him, we milked the cow, and we did all those things that we've all talked about. Could you imagine it? I'll tell you what, within two weeks we'll be falling out. Because it's human nature, friends. Because you are going to get my back up. And I am certainly going to get your back up. So, what does it mean when it says, love the brethren? You see, the reality is that when we speak of loving the brethren, we speak more than an, than an enjoyable chat after church. Far more than that. An element is to have good conversation, to enjoy one another's company, of course, and we do that as a church. We want to encourage one another in doing that even more, and being hospitable, and doing all these things that we should be and do. But it's more than just a good chat. 
It's more than a good walk or a good evening together. And Russell touched this when he took, when he spoke on fellowship. But I want to say to you primarily, it is far more than that. This is a life, friends, committed to the growth of one another in Christ Jesus. Are you committed to the growth of the brethren? Are you committed to one another today, this morning, for the good of your brother, that thou might grow in the knowledge of the love of the Lord Jesus? That you might stir one another up to good works. I ask you, how are we doing? How are we doing as a church? Well, finally, God will answer that. Again, I think we all confess room for improvement. We also have to be honest and say, I believe, in the main amongst us, that we're growing, that we are changing, that we are seeking at least to be this. But I ask you simple questions. Believe it or not, my, my aim is not to be very long this morning. But I ask you simple questions. How are you doing? You see, the, the, the issue is, in reality, like much of the Christian religion, we're talking about something that is internal rather than external. <coughs> Are you praying to one another? Do you pray? You might say, I don't, I don't know anyone's name yet. Get to know them. You might say, it's not me. It is you. Record to that. Are you praying for one another? Are you seeking Lord Jesus? Not only for your own not only for your own relationship with him, but that of course, if, if, don't, don't misquote me, that is primary, you and God. But we've had conversations before, haven't we, about sin. I don't want to sin because I don't want to displease my father, but I want to say this, I don't want to sin because I don't want to harm you. I don't, want to, I don't want to be an offence to you. I want to stir you up to love Jesus. I want, I want to be good for you. I want, to, I want to be right. I want to live like he lived. That you might also want to live like he lived. I don't want my agenda to be the first agenda on my list. In fact, if, if that is mine, then I am automatically disqualified to stand here. But friends, it doesn't stop here. It goes across. One thing that bores me with Christianity, or so-called, is just, just talk. Talk is cheap. You need to be real. <coughs> Are you making inquiry after one another? Are you making inquiry after one another? Some of you might say, where's the pastor's job? Yeah? I'll accept that it is my job, but I'm afraid right back at him and say it's yours as well. Are you making inquiry after one another? Some of the things recently have really encouraged me, the hospitality that people show, the hosting, swapping houses, making it possible that those who, who journey in don't have to go home if they want to return to the... Those things are great and encouraging. I'd love to see it. Let us seek to do it more. Let us seek to be better. Let us seek to be Christ-like. And the reality is, as I spoke of, Last time, it is this. The standard is Christ himself. Hereby we receive the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's it. That's simple. In word. Remember in Luke, somewhere, 15, 16, a friend comes to his neighbor by night. That's the bread. Many applications to that, of course. That is, us going to God. If we ask God for a loaf, He'll give us a loaf, friends. Don't we give us a stem. What about one another? Can I come to you at night? 
See, we, you, you might, you might be thinking, well, that's very practical. It is very practical, but I'm also talking spiritually. Are you on your knees for, your, for the brethren? Are you seeking God? Are you seeking God for our children? Are you seeking God for marriages? Are you seeking God that that person who has come into the church might find the fullness of Christ? We could go on. Friends, it's in these things I brought these to attention to you in my last visit in 1 John. And I finished like this, and I, I finished this point like this. And I plead with every person in this room as we grow as a church, and grow we are by His grace. But don't be a person who sits on the sidelines and watches on. It's not participation. That's observation. There's no room for observation, not in the body of Christ. I, I think, I, 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 I apply it very much to myself when we look at 1 Corinthians and talk about some are a foot, some are an ear, some are a little toe, some are a toenail. I don't think we value actually what we are to the body. Some of us aren't content to be the big toe or the little toe. We want the big stage, we want to be the preacher. Friends, if you're not called to such a thing, don't desire that. Are you happy to be the one that quietly goes away and prays? I'm saying to you, that is a task. Let us not, let us not despise what God has made us. Let us seek to do more. Do you know the gift God has given you? Spiritual gift that He's given you. Because there's not one person here who will not have one. He might not know it yet. Do you know it? Have a read of Romans 12. Let me go on before I go against everything that I've already said and take ages. The Apostle John goes on in verses 20 and 21. In fact, the latter part of 19, let me read it very quickly. Hereby we know that we are the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. You hear the word, assure our hearts before him. Then he says this, for our heart, for if our heart condemns, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemns not, then we, then have we confidence towards God. Friends, this is a difficult text, I confess. And I have struggled with it for some weeks. How does this fit into the context? What does this mean? I want to tell you that as you even go to good faithful comments, there's a very wavering view of what this means. Some see it from a very negative angle, others more of a positive angle. I think I see both. What I do believe, though, firmly, is that the Apostle John here is encouraging rather than condemning. I believe that these words are to encourage those who he's writing to. <coughs> I think that John here is trying to bring assurance to those who are in doubt about their salvation and who they are in Jesus Christ. But I see the danger also in this text. I see that if, if we, if I don't handle this correctly, I could offer, influ I could offer influence and false assurance. False assurance, what do I mean? Simply this, you think you're a Christian, but you're not. You think you're a Christian, but you're not. <clears throat> to give an idea that we should ignore the conscience of our own hearts, that we should dismiss every feeling. We ought not, friends. God has given us a conscience. The other day, I, I, um, I often do it, I left the house. Russell picked me up, he was very frustrated by me, actually. I was already late coming out. I said, I think I've left the oven on. My conscience made me go and have a look. And I'd not left the oven. And I knew I'd not. But conscience is a powerful thing. And God has given us a conscience. Conscience means knowledge. You know, in fact, the world knows. I mean, this, this is a doctrine in and of itself. I've got neither, maybe the ability or the time. But God has given everybody out there, if they look at creation, to know that there is a God. Conscience tells us. The 
the conscience ought not to be ignored. The inner feeling, if we can put it like that, ought not to be dismissed. But it's balancing out what they tell you. And that's what I'm going to try to do briefly this morning. I see also that if this isn't dealt with correctly, those who ought to have assurance could walk away less assured. That's the difficulty of this text. But there are those in here who have assurance and ought to and should celebrate the fact that they're a child of God. If I don't handle this properly, could go away less assured, wouldn't it? That would be tragic. You see the difficulty. But before we consider that, let us briefly just pull out the doctrine here, very quickly. Verse 20. For our heart, for if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. God is greater than our hearts and knoweth all things. Friends, God is omniscient. God is all knowing. How wonderful that is. And how much we could apply our lives to his knowledge. But it ought to bring great, great comfort here. Get fear and trembling here. How to bring them together. We ought, to, we ought to think about our lives. We ought to think about what tomorrow shall bring. We know that Matthew 6 teaches these things. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow is the cares of itself. We ought, to, we ought to believe that. Why? Because we serve a God who is omniscient. We serve a God who is all knowing. We serve a God who knows every hair on your head. And in that we trust. In that we walk. Knowing that we, as children, are kept by an all knowing, omniscient God. That ought to bring comfort, ought it? The things we worry about. How, often, how many nights have you lost sleep about something that doesn't really matter? Me, I'm the worst. Phil rang me up about the chair saying I've been up all night. <laughs> and you Phil. But we do, don't we? That's who we are. It's what we do. We'd be worried. We, and, and we're not going to get rid of that until we meet him and when we like him. But our friends, if it dominates our lives, if we are, if we are wrapped up in fear and worry, I'm not sure whether we've met this omniscient God yet. On the other hand, this all-knowing God, who knows the secret sins of your heart, who knows what you thought in that woman what passed. It's a fearful thing, isn't it? How do we deal with this? He is all knowledge. He is all wisdom. Have you ever thought what the difference between knowledge and wisdom is? What's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Imagine God having all knowledge, yet no wisdom. All knowledge, yet no wisdom. You've been no way applying that knowledge because there'd be no wisdom to apply. He is wise in all his doings. He is all knowledgeable. He is, he is knowledge. He is wisdom. You remember in Matthew 9 and verse 4, it said of Jesus, And Jesus, knowing your thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your heart? Do you remember the story? He knew what was in the heart of men. Again, that, 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 that in, in, in my application today, what I wanted to do is, is bring, bring fear in its right sense. Yet bring that sweet hope that it ought, if you're a believer. You know, he knows what's in the heart of man. He knows what's in my heart, even as I stand here and preach. He knows what I thought of you. He knows the frustrations. He knows my sin. But he knows this, that by his grace I seek to please him. And in that is comfort. So I was said to Christ, you remember on the boat, and the, the catch comes in. He says, now we are sure that thou knowest all things. <coughs> See, if we, if, we, if we had these truths set as stones, gems in the centre of our hearts, we'd be less fearful. We'd be more worshipful, that's for sure. 
We look the brethren in far better. We'd be quick to read his word. But we don't. We walk and live our life as if God is not on heaven. Proverbs tell us clearly the eyes of the Lord are in every place. The eyes of the Lord, friends, are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. You should be sat there this morning like two people, if you're a Christian. If you're not, you ought to be in fear. If you are, you would think of this. Thank God he knows all things. And you would think he knows that. Christian life is a strange life. Listen to this quick, quick quote. J.R. Packer said this. He knows, God referring to God, he knows everything about everything and everybody all the time. Also, he knows the future no less than the past and the present. Fathom it, friends. I'll read it again. He knows everything about every. He knows everything about everything and everybody all the time. That's a summary of what we've really been on this year. Also, he knows the future no less than the past and the present. Jared back. You see, friends, this is the God of our Bible, is it not? This is the God who said and stated, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. He is, as we read in the letter to the Hebrews, is the author and finisher of our faith. Only an all of How can God declare himself the author and the finisher of our faith if he is not all-knowing? How can God proclaim to be all-knowing if he is not the Alpha, the beginning and the end? Only an all-knowing God is capable of such a thing. And consider this. Ask yourselves. How could God judge the world, which he will, that day is coming, how could he judge righteously if he didn't know all things? He'd be ill-informed. He'd be, he wouldn't be the judge who we would proclaim him and hope him to be. When he judges friends, he will judge as an all-knowing God. Again, as believers, we rejoice, we sing about such things, we, we hope in such things, that we think, my word, how fearful we ought to be. So, friends, we should be in awe that our God is omniscient. We should be in awe that our God, who we have just enjoyed worshipping, that you spend your time, I trust, reading about, that when we meet to pray, you see our prayer meetings, how do we, how do I approach the prayer meetings? Do I approach a God who is some distant uncle, or am I approaching him with one who is all-knowing and able? Our friends is omniscient. Friends, how else would we, how else would we hope in him if he were not? How else would we, we trust in him if he were not? How else would we rely upon him if he were not? Saying such truth belong to him. Let me say this, such truth brings divine comfort to the believer. Brings divine comfort to the believer. John states something profound. God is greater than our hearts. He has to be. He has to be. He knows all things, even your heart. And this is where this text gets difficult. Because is that, is that negatively? Is that positively? Is this to bring condemnation or judgment or, or a squeezing of the believer? Maybe. I think I see some of that there. But 
But I want to say this, whatever is your heart is, we, we've heard this in, in evangelicalism in a poor sense, but there is a beauty in a true sense to what, what I'm about to say. The Lord knows your heart. Now that has been poorly applied. That, is, that has made us dismissive of sin. That has made us, doesn't matter how we worship him, it doesn't matter really because the Lord knows your heart. The Apostle John makes it clear. It's actually greater than your heart. So therefore, he has to know your heart. To be greater, he has to know. We often say to each other, don't we? You want the bad news or the good news? I don't know what you choose, but I think I'd rather the bad than the good. Let's stop there. Let's stop with the bad. What is the bad? Friends, the Lord knows this. In fact, the bad news is this. The Lord knows your heart. That's the bad news. The Lord knows your heart. That's bad news. What do you mean? Again, we could spend much time on this. I'm not going to. The Lord knows your heart. The Lord knows that you think nothing of him from Sunday to Sunday. The Lord knows that your communion with him is very dry. That your desire of him internally, and that's why I speak internal, not external. What do I mean by that? The issues of the heart. Not your not, not our attendance, not our not our external things that we might do. I might look like the perfect Christian because I might be able to preach. That's irrelevant to the context of what I'm trying to, uh, to communicate to you this morning. We're talking about internal issues. Not whether I look like a Christian or not, but what goes on in the heart of a man. And he knows. He knows what's in the heart of a man. He is greater than the heart of a man. Yeah. He knows if you are Lacking in communion with him, in fact, that it actually look like, you speak like you've got a desire for him, but he knows your heart, you really haven't. He knows. And let me say, there's no, there's no pulling the wool over God's eyes from us. You might be able to do it to your fellow Christian, but you won't do it to God. You might be able to do it to your pastor or your elder, or even your wife, and look like the part, act like the part, smell like the part, but if that internal issue is going on in the heart when really you have no love for God, you're dry. God is greater than your heart. Because yeah. he knows all things. No fault in God, friends. Yeah. He knows if your attendance is just called religion. Because he knows your heart. He knows the bitter attitudes that rarely go on in your heart. Yet you put on a smile. Despising of the brethren. How common that has been. He knows your heart. Your desire to pray. I heard something last night because me and Joy are watching a documentary on the period. And I'll tell you what, Samuel Rutherford, he said of him, he got up at 3 o'clock in the morning just to pray for the flock. Now the point isn't being that every pastor wants to get up at 3 o'clock and pray for the flock. That's not the point. That believer is like, <coughs> I tell you what, I was greatly challenged. What about you? The Lord knows your heart. You might want to a prayer, but better your heart is cold and dull in faith, and no affection for God. God is greater than you are. So, what's the bad news? The Lord knows your heart. It's a fearful thing. It's a fearful thing. As we were, we were listening to Tim Conway the, the other week on the, the afternoon service, we talked about the high place. I hope we went away and thought, what is my high place? You see, the problem is with dealing with these things that, 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 that you can lean into that my convictions are yours. My high place isn't yours, it's mine. And my high place to you might be something that's enjoyable to you. I trust you get the context. But the Lord knows your heart. 
He knows where you are at. There's no fool in him. And I think we have to apply that in that way. God is great in your hearts. Yes, he is. Is this you today, friends? Are you just doing the church thing? Are you just doing the church thing? Are you just attending church? I want to say to you, if it is, repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel and live a much better life. In Him. In Him. But my purpose this morning, more than that, is this. The good news. Because I think that's what John here is. He's really getting at. What's the good news? The Lord knows your heart. That's the good news. The Lord knows your heart. He is greater than your heart. Friends, there are many of us in this room today that continue day after day, hour after hour, to condemn themselves when Christ has forgiven you. It's right within the church. We live as if Christ has not come. We live as if Christ has not died. We live as if the blood has not been shed. That's how we live. Thank God the Lord knows that. Do you understand, friends, what I'm trying to say to this? This is what I believe the Apostle is doing. He's trying to encourage you. I know that within each church, and this is very much could be the same, that there are people in this room who are not yet Christians. And I will not be afraid to say it. Who have not yet really believed. They've gone through the rhetoric. They've gone through the waters of baptism, but they have not yet had their heart warmed. And I will not flee from preaching that. But I tell you this, I will not flee from this. There are people in this room who have not grasped the event of you. And I find it hard to preach, friends, because I haven't been there. In these days, I went down last night and I had a, I knew I was preaching this and it all flew in. How am I to stand before you? One day you're a child of God and then you're the son of hell in your own heart. Yeah? yeah. One day you love the Lord, the one day you one day the word of God is your meat and drink, the next minute you can't even turn the pages because you're not worthy. Friend, the Lord knows your heart. Again, one day, call yourself a child of God, and the next day, you're the son of hell, according to your own heart. Thank God that he is greater than our hearts. I acknowledge you've heard it enough from this pulpit. And I believe it and I preach. And ought, we ought to be more diligent. Confess that constant health itself, examination is a must. But not to the discredit of what Christ is doing in your life. <coughs> I know that this is true. There are some even today here, right now, that I pray to this, whose past sins still haunt them according to their own heart. And they can't get by it. Can't move on from it. Silent because it's true, isn't it? Yeah. Really? How, what, how, how have I received the, the grace of God? My sin. You see, the truth is, is when you understand true conversion, you look around you, and no one's as bad as you are. That's true conversion. You look around, you say, "I wish." Have you ever, have you ever said this? Have you ever said, "I wish I was there"? Have you ever said that in your heart? I wish I was like that person. I'll tell you what I have. Time and time again. This is the good news you see, because Lord knows you are. That sin, friends, is as far from the east as from the west. It's done. Christ died for it. 
mantra, as I, as I utter these words, that by the power of the Spirit, He applies it to us, to me. But He applies that it is done. That that's why He came. That's why He died. Why did Christ come? He came and died. That His, that his people shall be saved from what? Saved from depression? No. Saved from being poor? No. But save His people from their sin. And sometimes we live our life as if we're unforgiven. We've not yet grasped what Paul the Apostle sums up in a few words, the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, where sin abounded. Sin abound. Do grace much more abound. So that means simply this, children, if you listen. Adams, if you listen. No man sin in his mercy. That's the gospel. They sin abound. They grace much more abound. You see, we allow our own hearts to condemn us rather than trust in all that Christ has done for us. And I speak to you, I ache for a longing and deep understanding of the reality of that. Look at Paul the Apostle. What an example. Thank God that the, 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 the Christ and His mercy saved Paul the Apostle and used him. You see, we trust. You know, we can be all affluent and excellent in our doctrine. There'd be some of you who could probably come and give a 25 minute exhortation, justification by faith. Brilliant, we had it on Friday. Is it applied? We can trust in the atoning sacrifice of Christ. We claim that the blood has washed us. We claim that it's washed as white as snow. Yet we allow our own hearts to condemn us. Friends, God is greater than our hearts. And we don't trust in our hearts. That's what I'm saying. Don't trust in your heart. Don't ignore the affections of the heart. Don't ignore your conscience. If you know you're doing something that is sin, listen to your conscience, for goodness sake. But also know this, and sometimes we blame the devil. And he does get some of the blame. But we all talk at ourselves. And we live as if we've not been forgiven. The Apostle John encourages here as I finish. You see the danger that I presented earlier, don't you? You see the danger now, I hope. Because what I want to do today is if you belong to Christ and you know that you do, I want you to go out of here with great assurance than when you came in. Yeah. But all those of you who are, I'm not Christian. So listen to your conscience and call upon it. Apostle John has laid down for us these thoughts throughout his epistle. He is saying, This is what makes you a believer. This is the evidence that makes you a believer. Not your rituals, not your religion, that you have fellowship with God, that you have fellowship with one another, that you love the brethren, that you love his commandments, that you're a person who confesses sin, so forth. Friends, these are the things that tell us that we belong to Him. So that is what usurps of your life. That is what covers your heart. Because you can look at these things and say, that, that is applicable to me by the grace of God. That is what God has made me by His grace. That is what I am. I am not what I ought to be, but I'm not what I was. This is who I am. As the Apostle Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. And he brings us to these words that ought to those who believe today great assurance. God called his people his children. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. Verse 1 of chapter 3, that we should be called what? Partakers? No. 
been fostered in for a while? No. What does it call us? Sons of God. We see that all through this epistle. Beloved, now we are. We dealt with this and we work through. Beloved, now are we. Now, now. I'll tell you what, friends. Today, the day in which you were glorified, the day in which you, meet, you shall meet Christ, shall be no more of a Son of God than you are now. You walk into the fullness of it. But today, if you're a Son of God, you're a Son of God. How precious these truths are. Romans 8 tells us that Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Have you yet experienced that? It's that that's greater than our hearts, friends. Let the Spirit testify it with our spirit that we are the children of God. I want to finish with the words from the, the Apostle John. And then we will pray. Look at the play of this man. John chapter 21. Go from here. 